Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to development of Six Sigma part two. And here is the quality improvement method course. We have talked in the previous session about the development of Six Sigma and the history uh, of General Electric and Motorola and their roles of establishing the Six Sigma. We have covered um, the unique about Six Sigma uh, in terms of uh, quality improvement methods compared to uh, total quality management, uh, why we use Six Sigma, and the framework of the Six Sigma, as well as um, um, the traditional view versus the non-traditional view. And uh, also we talked about the, uh, the success factors, the key success factors um, for the Six Sigma methodology. And it's widely implemented in both manufacturing and non-manufacturing industries. And we stopped here when we compared the Three Sigma company versus the Six Sigma company, how things are different between them in terms of the performance, in terms of how they look to the improvement, how the, uh, they spend their sales for um, 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 the defects or failures uh, between the Three Sigma and the Six Sigma company. Today, we will continue with a new concept that introduced to the Six Sigma and it becomes as a, a partner all the time we hear a Lean Six Sigma together, LSS. And um, the Lean Six Sigma also discussed in, in details in a separate um, recorded session, you can find it in the channel. But today we will talk about uh, briefly what is the Lean. The Lean is the methodology for increasing the speed of production by eliminating process steps which don't add value. It focuses on uh, reducing uh, or eliminating waste and defects in the process. And at the same time, um, the delay that uh, happens or eliminate delays in the, in the process. Waste also explained in the uh, Lean Six Sigma uh, recorded session uh, is being discussed in details and there are uh, several types of uh, waste. So the Lean focus in reducing and eliminating waste um, and the Six Sigma works in reducing and eliminating the variability just to distinguish between the two objectives. So imagine when they work together you reduce waste and defects in your process. At the same time, you reduce uh, variability in your process. So therefore, the integration between Lin Six Sigma became very common and widely used. The five principles of the Lean are listed here, starting from customer value, then uh, stream, a value stream, flow, pull, perfection. Customer value, basically, you identify the customer uh, uh, value and uh, their need and their requirements. Value stream, does the work or the step you do in every uh, um, um, action or in every step in your process, is it added value to your customer value or not? And then the flow, you apply just-in-time production and just-in-time production is uh, explained in a separate uh, recorded session. You can find it in the Lean Six Sigma. And how you achieve a continuous flow without delay and without uh, waste. Pull, make your customer take the initiatives in the service and uh, demand push the value stream. So you make the demand who push the service and push your process. Perfection, which definitely is the optimal objective of the lean is eliminating the waste. So this is a continuous loop starting from the customer value and end in the perfection and keeps going and going. This is the lean principles and the lean thinking and lean concept was originated in Toyota and see how is now in two integration between two different um, uh, 
methods the six sigma established as we saw in the previous session from Motorola then General Electric and the lean was started in Toyota in Japan uh, originated by uh, Sakichi Toyoda in 1920 or end of 1930 the implementation was fully started and then we can see these days the integration between the Lean Six Sigma um, is very high and there is interaction actually between them and this table shows how the interaction goes as you reduce the number of steps in the process by reducing the number of steps in the process you are going to reduce the non value added steps when you remove steps uh, what we talk about removing steps here we talk about non-added value that means steps are not necessarily to be done when you reduce them you are at the same time work on six sigma improvement quality for the value added steps you are increasing the sigma level so as you are reducing the number of steps you are giving the chance to the six sigma here to reduce the variability imagine i have a variability comes from 40 steps even if i'm going to implement the six sigma to reduce the variability is better i will re uh, work on one step only and reduce the variability for that step compared to the 40 and now we are talking about 40 steps uh, could be a source of variation but now this is just something like um, uh, um, chose here in the table doesn't mean it has to be exactly 40 or one step here to show us the amount of steps appear in the process it could cause variability and it causes the decrease of the sigma level as you can reduce the number of non value added steps as you give the chance to the six sigma to improve the quality of uh, the value added steps for the remaining steps that have value added you have the chance to reduce their variability and improve the sigma level into uh, the highest level you can so this synergy or interaction between the lean and the six sigma shows how those two methods work together and there are a set of tools um, listed under the lean six sigma recorded session for the lean concept and other tools for the Six Sigma. So in implementing um, Lean Six Sigma project, you can use both of them in the DMake framework as it's needed on the right phase that uh, need to be implemented, uh, whether in improve phase or control phase or any other phases uh, needed. So that was the integration. So we can refer after World War II the evolution comes countries start to think about the quality and uh, um, how they reduce cost in terms of the increasing the production and uh, um, reducing variability and defects in their products um, um, we've seen also the um, uh, how the quality um, um, methods compared to the six sigma how the six sigma should shows that um, a rigid method that based on statistics and also can work as a, a vision and business strategy and goals uh, and adopted that time to reduce this um, uh, variability and the lean initiated also in 1930s uh, in japan to reduce and eliminate waste so those two integrated together in a way that can perfect the the, the process um, when we now go back to the six sigma we are going to explain in in this session um, how we measure the sigma level and the defect rate there are the most common way to measure the sigma level is the dpmo level uh, or the dpmo um, um, method which is defect per million opportunities what is the defect per million opportunities before that we have again to revise what is the standard deviation of the sigma level is the standard deviation that measure the variability اللي هو ال يعني التذبذب في ال 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 results حقة القياسات variability تغير okay so um, this uh, standard deviation or the sigma level measure the variability measure التغير في the process or the performance defects 
a measurable outcome that is not within the acceptable specification limit. عندك specification limits مثلا 3 millimeters uh, plus and minus for uh, dimension, certain dimension. يعني لقياس معين عندك tolerance or specification, let's say not tolerance, um, um, 3 millimeter في القياس of any exceeding to this uh, specification limits considered to be uh, defect. And defects has to be, if you recall when we talked about the Six Sigma, the critical to quality, it has to be identified from external, also considering the internal. Well, the internal, they will establish the, the defining the defect, but you have to listen to the external customers, not relying only on your internal organization. Defects per unit, DPU, basically you divide the number of defects you discovered or you found, divided by the number of units produced. You produce 1,000 units, you found um, uh, 100 defects units, then you divide the 100 over the 1,000. The defects per million opportunity, DPMO, the number of defects discovered, and you found it, Divided by the opportunities of error. Each opportunity of error. For us, ظهور الخطأ. For us, ظهور الخطأ. Opportunities of error. Then all this times one million. Those are very basic formula. We will take an example now. Imagine you have or consider uh, organization produce pencils. مراسم. There are five defects opportunities per pencil. عندنا خمسة أنواع من الأخطاء أو العيوب خلينا نقول اللي تعتبر في البنسل starting from the lead, uh, wood, eraser, eraser clasp and label those are five opportunities for us لظهور العيب في البنسل your organization averages of four defects every 100 unit عندها معدل متوسط لأربع عيوب uh, في 100 units لكل 100 units they found for defects calculate or determine the DPMO for this example well first we have to find the total opportunities the total opportunities by multiplying the number of units and 100 by the number of defects per uh, defects opportunities per unit so we have to multiply the 100 times the number of defects opportunities per unit. And then five opportunities here. The unit al wahda, a unit al pencil al wahid can have five opportunities. So we multiply the number of units 100 times the five, and that will equal to 500. Um, 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 they call it uh, uh, per opportunity. The defects opportunity when producing 100 pencils equal 500. So defect opportunity for the amount of production or amount of uh, units you have. So now we find first the total opportunities which equal the number of uh, units times the total number of opportunities that we can find uh, the defects. So we multiply the number of opportunities here, the five times the number of units, and that give us the total uh, defects opportunities when we produce the 100 pencil. After that, we find the defect rate and we have the defect average here. You divide it by the number of defects opportunity to find the defect rate for all the opportunities you have. For all these opportunities, المعدل الأخطاء الممكن ظهوره. معدل الأخطاء ممكن ظهوره عندنا four defects every 100 unit. A total units and in a 100, we multiply it with the number of opportunities. اللي هي الخمسة. فيصير عندنا 500 defect opportunity. To get the defect rate, we divide the 
average defects or the number of defects divided by the defect opportunities of the production and that will be 4 divided by the 500 and that will give us the defect rate or معدل defect. When we get the defect rate, we multiply it with 1 million and that will equal to 8,000. There is a common question comes always why we use the 1 million. If we could find the defect rate from here, why we multiply it later with the 1 million? Well, 1 million considered like a barometer, like a scale, because um, the, if you think about it, converting the defect rates to per uh, million opportunity or to, or to per million, um, it will enlarge the picture. So you can look to the picture of your defect clearly. Why? The number of defects shrinks to virtually nothing. When we divide the four divided by 500, or imagine if you have here, instead of 100, you have 1,000, okay? So when you divide the 400 to a large number to get the defect rate, you will get a small number of defects. And that will show you a lot of fractions and decimals that will uh, not make it easy for you to identify the quality performance of that process. But by using the 1 million opportunity, as the barometer, we have a resolution in the measurement to count defects all the way up to the six sigma. Is You can imagine it to the nano scale. If you think about it, when they say five nano, if we are going to convert this five nano to a meter, okay, to, or to a kilometer, it will be a large number to look at them and compare between them. So that's why you use this scale so the resolution of the measurement will be clearer and to count defects easier and even when you come to the six sigma level, which is only 3.4 defects per million uh, opportunity, when you find the defect rate, you will not be uh, seeing that a lot of uh, decimals. The six sigma level consider only 3.4 defects per million opportunity. And here, you see that there are there is 8,000 defects per million opportunity, whereas in the Six Sigma level, there is only 3.4 3, uh, 3 defects per million opportunity. And other recorded session, you will see the table that shows um, um, the relation between the DPMO and the Sigma level. You can see it under the review of the Six Sigma, so we don't repeat the information over uh, on other sessions. So you can refer to that uh, recorded session to see the table. Other way to calculate the DPMO is using the defect rate, uh, uh, using the process capability index, the CP and the CPK. The CP and the CPK it was discussed in the quality control course under the process capability chapter. And today is a recap for what is the difference between CP and the CPK and how we use them in terms of calculating the DPMO or the sigma level. The CPA uh, or the CP, sorry, compares the specification range or tolerance to process width regardless where the process is centered. You see here, this is a CPA process capable in terms of the, or has a potential capability, but is not centered. It's a way of the specification. And you can compare it to here. You see how it's wide in terms of the variability. And here it's narrow. The deviation is very narrow, but it's away from the center line of the specification. The CPK measure how close the process center to the nearest customer specification. It shows you here how the process is close to the center of the uh, specification. But you see the upper and lower thirds are exceeding the specification limits due to the fact that the CPA is not on the acceptable uh, range. 
a relation between the six sigma or the sigma level and the process capability graphically it shows here here is where it falls the 3.4 dpmo and the six sigma uh, standard level it falls here so you have to be half of your tolerance not your specification you have to be away of your specification your process can move within this green area here the green area here your process can move around it it's fine this is they call it 1.5 sigma level or 1.5 shift in the mean of the sigma level away from the tolerance specifications not the uh, um, uh, tolerance um, uh, upper limit and lower limit not the specification upper and lower the tolerance uh, limit which is the natural uh, uh, limit or the natural um, um, uh, tolerance we have whether in a material or machines or human um, but the specification that you set based on the customer requirements that's something it has to be your process away from and you don't get close to it because when you get close to um, uh, to here or there is a chance to exceed it that's mean you are going to produce defects so the six sigma work on this border here so you try as much you can to be in the green area to be uh, um, um, away from the specification limit and centered uh, and centered your process so if your process moves a little bit here so it will be close to the border but at least not exceeding the specification limit so our target we don't exceed the specification limit and we perform within this range here of the six sigma you try as you can to be centered in the process and reduce the variability of moving around because there is always must be a variability but when you have variability allowance 1.5 will give you the chance to work on this side or you come to this side without exceeding the specification limits um, the acceptable um, uh, index for the process capability uh, the cpk is has to be greater than 1.3 the acceptable this is a good uh, process capability index from 1.33 until 2 the um, 1 to 1.33 this is considered to be acceptable not acceptable if you are in, uh, performing under uh, 1 for the cpk that's mean you're centered you are away from the center so your cpk at that time you see the CPK here in the gray normal distribution. This is 1.5. And see how is uh, the, the lower tier of the normal distribution is close to here. If you are going to work under the CPK, that means you will be, your tail will exceed the lower specification limits and you will exceed the six standard deviation and uh, that's what happens here and that's what happens here uh, this is for the due to the cp but this is due to the cpk you see how it's exceeding the specification limits even though if it's close to um, 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 uh, the normal distribution it's uh, close to the uh, upper specification but due to the natural variability, it's exceeding the upper specification limits. So your CPK should not be less uh, that, uh, than one. It has to be greater than one. And if it's greater than 1.33 until two, two, that's mean your process is exactly centered as we see here in this uh, blue normal distribution. When CP and the CPK are equal, to two that's mean the process is centered and the variability at the best level for the cp um, the acceptable level it has to be greater than 1.3 and in the cpk it has to be greater than one so you have to pay attention uh, the acceptable level from 1.33 until 1.67 uh, 
greater than 1.67, that is the good level for the uh, potential process capability or the CP. Um, if you are below the 1.33, that means your process is unacceptable. If you are falling exactly on the range 1.3, then you are in the okay level. The same for the uh, CPK. If you are exactly one, that means you are in the okay level, but you are on the border. So you have to work on the control of the process uh, because your process would be um, uh, performing critically uh, on the border of the control and it may fall on the red zone so it will come to this zone some of this normal tail, uh, distribution tails may exceed the uh, specification limits so this is how the graphical demonstration shows the relation between the CP, key, uh, CP and the CPK and this is uh, with the Six Sigma the calculation again just to recap how we calculate the process capability uh, for the two sides which is the cp upper specification minus a lower specification divided by the six times standard deviation for the process uh, capability uh, uh, cpk for the two sides we have to calculate the cpu the process capability for upper and the CPL, the process capability for the lower specification. The CPK, uh, the CPK, sorry, again, will be the minimum of the CPU and the CPL. Uh, for the CPU, you uh, subtract the upper specification limits minus the mean divided by three standard deviation. For the CPL, you subtract the mean because it would be greater than the lower specification limits divided by three standard deviation. And for the CPK, you take the minimum value of those two here. Um, in, in the examples that we will see, if you have the mean given to you and the standard deviation, you find uh, the sigma level based on the CPK. If you have only the standard deviation given to you in the problem, then you find the sigma level based on the CP. Here is an example for estimating defects rate using the process capability index, whether you are going to uh, calculate the DPMO or the sigma level. Uh, the example says time to process a student loan application, قرض uh, Processing time, which is the process of the loan or the loan that we agree on, standard equal 26 working days. So this is the standard specification for this process of approving the student loan is 26 working days. The specification limits 20 to 20 uh, to 32. That means the lower specification is 20, and the upper specification is 32. Uh, working days the standard deviation for that process is two working days the question asks you to use the cp index process capability uh, for potential to calculate student loan application and process sigma level so how we do that we go back to the formula here the cp is the a subtraction between the upper specification minus the lower specification divided by six times the standard deviation. So the upper specification here is 32 minus 20 divided by six times the standard deviation is two, and that equals to one. And when we refer to our uh, process capability index uh, parameters and values, if you recall this uh, figure here, um, the CP has to be greater or equal to 1.33 to be acceptable. So if we have a value CP like here, um, one, that means it's not capable. And the sigma level associating with the CP equal one is three sigma level. And the DPMO is 66,811. So uh, whether are you calculating the DPMO, you get it uh, from this table or the sigma level. Now, maybe the question says, okay, what about if I have a CP value that is not listed here? For example, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, or 0 
you will do interpolation to get the value for the Z, or which is the sigma level, or the DPMO. And we will see that in the next example. Um, the recommendation here for the process is to ensure the process variation. You have to have the process variation, have the design tolerance between the tolerance and the CP has to be equal to, so and allowing the 1.5 standard deviation uh, uh, mean shift, um, uh, allowing the 1.5 standard deviation shift around the mean, so your uh, normal distribution tells the upper and lower can freely go around the mean, but at the same time within the tolerance and do not exceed the tolerance and um, the movement here, as we explained earlier, why we leave this shift, this is due to the regular variation it could happen. And as you can have your process um, um, variability uh, narrowed and centered, as you can have the room for movement around the average uh, uh, mean of the, uh, of the data, uh, of the process, I mean, or, or your specification, the center line of your specification, and that will um, prohibit from having a defects uh, exceeding the specification limits. And as you can see, and when the CP equal to, and even the CPK equal to both of them, the defects per million opportunity is 3.4, and that will be the six sigma level, and that's mean you are performing um, along the six sigma level, at the same time, you are in the middle or half, or your uh, process variation is half the tolerance design, is half the tolerance here, the upper and lower. Now, you may have the question sometimes, and instead of having the specification limits, uh, you may have the tolerance, and then you have to add the tolerance into the standard and subtract it from the standard to get the upper and lower. So you may have uh, plus or minus six days or five days. Then you have to add five days to get the upper specification and subtract five days to get the lower specification. If you have a CP 1.33 or uh, more, uh, that's mean you are, your process is capable and uh, then you can also look for the DPM on the sigma level. But when I have a process like that is not capable, I have to work on the process capability first. That means my process are not able to perform and meet the specification. So first I have to meet the specification and then work on improving the, um, the sigma level and reducing the DPM or level in my process. Um, always our target in the CPs uh, whether CPK or CP, um, to have a 2.0, and that's mean is the best uh, way for potential process capability index CP or the centering um, uh, process capability CPK. Um, also here, um, if we think about it comparing to the DPMO sigma level calculation or measuring the defect using the DPMO, um, here we don't identify the um, uh, opportunities for the defects. For example, if you recall the example we solved um, today about the pencil, uh, when we calculated the chances or the opportunities for the defects, whether from the eraser or from the wood or from all the places where the defect can appear, and, and that, by the way, set by both external and internal customers to identify those defects. That gives you a different perspective and way in calculating the sigma level. And if you can identify the opportunities and calculate the defects uh, per unit, that would be more reliable in terms of the, um, finding the defect rate using uh, the uh, DPMO instead of the process capability uh, index. The process capability index, on the other hand, doesn't do that. So here uh, we are working with the final uh, product or with the final um, um, after the, uh, the process being um, uh, completed for the service, if we are talking about service, if a product is being produced already, 
and detecting the defect, it will be based on the specification that you set for maybe a certain or for one uh, criterion only. And for the other criterions, you also have to have and uh, calculate the specification for those and you calculate all those, uh, also the CP and the CPK because here we are dealing with one criteria. Now we are talking only with the working days. If the defects could appear from other uh, opportunities or other criterions rather than the working days, then we have to work on them in the same manner. Um, but to get the overall picture, uh, it would be better to have the first method by having and identifying all the opportunities, and then you count all the defects appear from all the opportunities, and then you calculate the DPU and then transfer it to the DPMO, and um, from there you can identify the sigma level. But we are talking in a case or in a situation you don't have um, um, the, the chance or the resources that allow you to calculate the defect rate using the DPMO. Um, so in this case, we use uh, something that is also handy and give us a good estimation about our process. So we use the process capability index. Uh, for the next example, we use uh, the CPK as the example request. The example here asks for processing housing loan. And this time, it's a different processing um, uh, or it's, it's a different um, service that the bank offer. Uh, average, now this is average, not standard, pay attention. The average is 25 working days and the standard deviation is three working days where the upper uh, specification and lower specification given as 32 and 20 working days. Use CPK index to calculate student loan application process sigma level. Now, um, one of the things that to identify which to use, whether CP or the CPK, if the question asks you directly, then there is no uh, room for which one should I use. Like here, says use CPK index. But if it says use process capability and just leave it there, you look in the question and the example, whether I have the mean or I have the standard uh, of the, or the specification um, um, uh, limit. For example, um, using the CPK, it will require from you the formula, if we recall the formula here, we have to find the CPU and the CPL, the uh, process capability, for the upper specification and for the lower. And those, they will require the average X bar. So if the X bar is given, I will be able to calculate the CPK in this time. If the X bar is not given, the only way to find the defect rate is using the CP because the, this is the index that it doesn't require the average. Now, if you have both, and this is maybe you have in your mind, okay, what about if I have the average and the standard? Then you can use either one, you can use both of them, and, and um, depend on that question. If the question asks you directly, as we said, then you follow the question. If the question gives you all the information needed, the standard, the average, standard deviation, tolerance or specification limits, then you can use either one, okay? This is to show you um, um, how the examples could come in a different um, ways and also ask you the same to find the process sigma level. So what we do is we apply to the formula. The CPK is the minimum of the CPU and the CPL. How we calculate the CPU, which is the uh, process capability for upper specification or based on the upper specification, you subtract the upper specification minus the average divided by three times the standard deviation. So the upper specification here I have it is 32 minus the average is 25 divided by three times the standard deviation is equal also to three. So the, the chance here we have the standard deviation is equal three as well as um, it has to be multiplied with the constant three. For the lower specification, I will subtract the average first from the lower specification 
divide it by three times the standard deviation again. The value we have for the CPU is 0.7, the lower is 0.5. The CPK is selecting the minimum among those two, so 0.55 will be the CPK value. Again, the process here is not capable because the 0.5 is falling on the not capable region. The capability of CPK, you have to have a value of one or more to have a, um, a, a process capable. And 1.5 and 2, that would be a, a very good um, centering for the process around the specification. And that's really the indication for the um, uh, specification, uh, sorry, for the process, whether it's centered or not, the CPK index is the one identify that. So the process is not capable, and you, same recommendation, you have to ensure that the CPK is 2, and the process variation in the half of the design tolerance here, so uh, allowing also um, the mean shift with the 1.5 standard deviation. And the sigma level found to be here falling between two CPK values that are not given in the table. So you do interpolation, you have the um, Z value or the DPML, depending on what you are calculating, the uh, DPM or the sigma level. The question here asks you about the sigma level. If the question asks you about the DPMO, then you have to find the DPMO. So um, the Z value is one when the CPK is 0.33. 0.55 falls between 0.67 and 0.33. So I have 0.55 given here in the middle and leads to X unknown. Then I have also two sigma level equals to 0.67 CPK. So I solve this equation, Tarafain uh, Fosatain, linear algebra equation, first degree, one unknown, lower X, which is the Z value at 0.55, when you solve this equation, you will get the sigma level is 1.6. And that's mean the process both is not capable and the sigma level is very low. So the process has to work on their capability before I monitor it or control it or even I improve it. You have to work first in meeting your specification and then you can work in improving your uh, performance by reducing the variability of your process and uh, improving your um, um, DPMO level in uh, reaching the high sigma level, by reaching high sigma level. That was um, the, the two examples of estimating the defect rate using the process capability index. And by this, we come here to the end of this um, uh, session. We are closing here with the Six Sigma, how it's implemented in academia. Um, many institutes um, um, and universities, schools in US implemented the Six Sigma methodology in their operation, whether in the scheduling or whether in the finance or in different sectors. Those are um, um, names of universities and schools implemented the Six Sigma. Also here in the uh, lower table, those schools teaching Six Sigma, so they offer you undergraduate uh, program or a, a diploma certificate in Six Sigma from these universities and also nowadays also other schools. It's not just um, 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 an institute uh, for training, those universities. Um, like University of Georgia, University of uh, Georgian Institute of uh, Technology, um, all these well-known, uh, Columbus State, um, all these known uh, universities, and um, they provide you uh, programs in the Six Sigma. This is how uh, the spread of the Six Sigma become these days, and it became a well-known name for um, solid methodology and robust method for solving problems, also to establish and maintain uh, goals in your organization. I hope you enjoyed this session. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.